Good morning, my grandchildren and friends from afar. It's a humid day out there today. Might get some rains even. I'm going to take a look today at Jeremiah 24. It's a short little chapter. and We've been having some, some long chapters. Uh, but here we're going to have a little short one. But a very deep, meaningful chapter. <clears throat> Dear Lord, help us stay out of the ditches, Father, and help us receive that which you would have us receive, Father, day by day, every day. We love you, Father. We need you. We believe. The Lord showed me, and behold, two baskets of figs were set before me, were set before the temple of the Lord. Uh, after that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away uh, captive uh, Jehoiada and the son of Jehoiakim, uh, king of Judah, and the princes of Judah with the carpenters and smiths uh, from Jerusalem and had brought them to Babylon. So we got, uh, we got a couple of baskets of figs here. Now, they're at the door of the temple. It said uh, one basket had very good figs even like the figs that are first ripe. The other basket had very naughty figs, which could not be eaten, they were so bad. Now everybody reads this scripture, and everybody <clears throat> has an idea of what these figs represent. And it depends on what stage we are in our spiritual development. Uh, as I see these figs today, uh, being how their bows brung to the uh, temple, uh, these are all people that are looking for God. These are not people like atheists and people that are not looking for God. They're not even presented in either of these baskets. But these, uh, these are people that's looking for God. They're looking for truth and understanding. Um, the other basket in very naughty fig. Okay. Uh, three reads. Then said the Lord unto me, what seest thou, Jeremiah? And I said, figs. The good figs, very good. And the evil, uh, very evil. And cannot be eaten. They are so evil. Uh, when I read this, uh, I, these are uh, figs that are... are um, that. Some of these figs turn God's face away. Some of these figs don't because they're good, but some of them are very evil. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Like these figs, so will I acknowledge them uh, that are carried away captive of Judah, uh, which I have sent out of this place, unto a land of the Chaldeans for their good. Uh, uh, the good figs here, he's still talking about these good figs. They're going into captivity. But uh, Matthew Henry uh, refers to this as a loving father who has given the uh, child correction uh, for their good. And then we got another group of figs here who, are, who ain't going to make the cut. And uh, this is going to prove to be the carnal mindedness of us all. We're both these basket of figs at different times in our lives. Uh, let me uh, let me get back to where I was. The land of the Chaldeans for their good. For I will set mine eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them again to this land. They're coming back around to that promised land. And I will build them and not pull them down. And I will plant them and not pluck them up. And I will give them an heart to know me. This is very important. Matthew Henry points out, and I picked up on this when I first read it, that it's the heart that has to know God. Not the mind. He doesn't give. Uh, he doesn't uh, worry about the brain, the uh, the carnal, because this is what the naughty figs are. 
But for these figs that are coming back, that's a good grace with God, that are now being uh, uh, corrected. Uh, they know God in the heart. And they're going to come back around to that spiritual way of being. And they uh, be, shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. Now, this is not so much the head uh, to know me, but the heart to know me. Uh, I wrote down there in, in my little notes. And as the evil figs, which cannot be eaten, they're, they're not good for anything. Uh, they are so evil, surely... Thus saith the Lord, So will I give Zedekiah, the king of Judah, and his princes at the residue. Now notice who these people are. These people are the ones who are staying behind. They're not sent out. They're not on that journey. They're not on that walk. They're, uh, they're going to stay with their old first mindset. This is the carnal. They're going to stay in the first. Their first place. They're not going anywhere. Uh, princes of the residue of Jerusalem that remain in this land. These guys are staying right there. They're not, they're not changing the way they think. They're, they're staying right there where they are. And them that dwell in the land of Egypt. This has always been the, uh, the problem of the Jews, uh, what we consider to be the Jewish people today. They did not <clears throat> want to evolve to that spiritual revelation of Jesus Christ when Jesus came to this earth. So they stayed in the old temple, back in the old land, the old place. They never evolved. They never stayed. I mean, they stayed. They never moved away from their old way of thinking, which is a carnal way of thinking about God's Word. And therefore, they, uh, this is why uh, they're, uh, for the moment, lumped into this basket of bad figs. But uh, the Bible tells us that every knee is going to bend and every head is going to bow. And I believe a great awakening is coming to our Jewish brothers, as well as many other people that seek God in the carnal. And uh, they're going to be saved. And I will deliver them uh, to be removed unto all kingdoms of the earth. And if you think about the plight of the Jewish people, they were looking, they were like the people without a, without a home, the wandering Jew. They wandered around the earth. And everywhere they showed up, they found trouble. As uh, we saw with uh, Hitler in Germany and, and other places. And today, uh, we see this trouble is still on the horizon for them with an uh, a ongoing war about the people that just do not want to, uh, for these Jews to have a home. Why? Because they're, they're still in that carnal state. They can't be blessed by God because they are still carnal. Uh, thinking about the scripture and the carnal, instead of having that revelation of Jesus Christ being God in the flesh. Until we get that revelation, until we accept that uh, Jesus is God, our, our lives are going to be pretty tough. And I will deliver them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth for their hurt. This is a, it's like a, if you've got a kid, a bad kid that's having a temper tantrum, and he's rolling around kicking and smashing his his feet and his knuckles on the ground in a fit of anger. This is for his hurt. Uh, but don't worry, that hurt is what brings healing. To be a reproach and uh, a proverb, a taunt and a curse in all places, whether I shall drive them. And I will send the sword, the famine. That famine is for the word of God, for the understanding of the word of God. Amen. And the pestilence among them, till they be consumed from off the land uh, that I gave unto them and their fathers. Uh, and that's it for that little chapter. It's pretty sharp. And I will comb over uh, some of Matthew Henry's notes. But uh, show you what he had to say. If anybody has any interest in his notes, you can pause this camera over... Uh, as I skim over these notes where you can take a read of them. And uh, Matthew Henry's notes is always a good help. It always helps uh, our spiritual understanding uh, get a, uh, mature. Uh, when we first start to understand that this book is written to us in a, uh, in a carnal way as well as a spiritual way, 
We first spend most of our lives understanding and reading and researching and understanding that carnal way. And this is what this Bible is talking about. We're kind of captive in our carnal state of mind. And as we, uh, as we develop and graduate spiritually by revelation of Jesus Christ alone, uh, until we get to that stage, uh, we're, we're captive and we're just like these wandering Jews that spend uh, an eternity uh, just uh, trying to uh, comprehend and wait for a Savior, wait for uh, the coming of the Messiah, that the Messiah has already came. Same thing with our spirit. You know, the Jews are basically a likeness for the carnal-minded. And uh, many Christians will, who call ourselves Christians will can be in the same boat as that wandering Jew. Because on, the Jews is a likeness for carnality, or that set of people. And this is the Bible talks about the seven churches in the end. One of the uh, churches that uh, had uh, that God was uh, pleased with more than the other five and there was two churches he was pleased with more than five. One of them was uh, Samaria, and uh, I think the other one was Philadelphia. And uh, one of those churches uh, knew the truth about them that called themselves Jews but were lying. Uh, and and uh, uh, to be a true Jew, one has to believe on and in Jesus Christ. He has to acknowledge that uh, Jesus Christ was the, uh, the Messiah. He is the Savior. Now, you know, back then they were all looking for this great, powerful king to arise and defeat uh, the Romans and, uh, and uh, give uh, Israel rule of the world. And when they saw this little dusty guy come up out of the wilderness and his little, uh, been walking on foot and didn't have nobody to carry him uh, like so many kings did back in those times on those uh, chariots or something like that, he was basically a poor man. Uh, he was poor in uh, mammon. He was poor in money. And he didn't have armies of people uh, coming in behind him to conquer in the flesh. He came to conquer in the spirit. So these people, these Jews, these uh, Jews, people who said they were of our brother Judah and lied because they wouldn't accept Jesus Christ, uh, they could not see a king in Jesus Christ and they despised him in a and our, our carnal hearts, I mean, our carnal minds do the same thing today. And this is what keeps us from having a, a spiritual understanding of these great books, these beautiful breasts that nourish us, uh, the Old Testament and the, and the New Testament. These are the breasts of life from which we gain our understanding and, uh, and our spiritual discernment. Uh, I've enjoyed reading this little short chapter. I got the grandkids uh, with me here today. They'll be getting up shortly. I hope your grandkids are studying your Bibles as you're reading back through these old uh, videos. Um, yesterday we went out to the lake and had a wonderful time. Took our shoes off and walked in that lake and cooled down. It was a very hot day. Um, I'm, I'm reminding you of this because if you're watching this when you're 20 or 30, you probably most likely have no memory of that day. And uh, But... Um, through me mentioning this to you as you're watching this video years later, as those memories are lost, that memory can be reborn uh, from you hearing me talk about it. And then it may encourage your old memory to wake up and remember that day. Uh, God works like this in many ways in the scriptures. And uh, I just wanted to bring that to your attention. There are things that, we, uh, that we've forgotten in our humanity. There are things that we got away from things that were easy and natural as a young child but the world jades us and takes us away from uh, the basic uh, connection we have with God but uh, uh, remember that there is a connection there with God my grandchildren remember that uh, even though you read these words and you may not have understanding because uh, many people read these words all their lives and though they can quote chapter and verse, they don't have understanding of what they, what they mean. They only have carnal understanding. But if you read that word and reach out to God in your heart, you can realize that this is all, uh, also spoken to the Spirit. Uh, and that way, uh, you can be born again. Um, as I like to say always in these videos, look us up. We are in the book. 
And I'm starting to say now that remind us all to trust the plan. God has a good one. I love you. That's why I read these books. And come on back and read with us some more, won't you?